Have you ever wondered how to make compost? In this short segment with Dr. Elaine Ingham, world-renowned soil biologist, she shares some really fundamental tips and strategies to make good compost. I'm Natalie Forsbauer from Heart and Soil Magazine. I'm really excited you're part of this conversation. Heart and Soil Magazine is the magazine and resource people go to to learn about regenerative farming and gardening and regenerative living from experts, farmers, leaders and scientists in the regenerative space. It's full of interviews, resources, strategies, stories, tips, and how to be an advocate for yourself and for the planet to live regeneratively, to exist and coexist regeneratively. It's an amazing community that amplifies global regenerative health and planetary health through regeneration. If you haven't subscribed yet, I invite you to head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com, click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. So when we're looking to make compost, you have to, again, ask the question of what are you trying to do? Uh, what kind of plant are you trying to grow? Where are you starting on your own property? Is it, is it the sand pit or is it the clay pit or you know, something that's got a little bit of organic matter in there? There's some biology in there, yay! But is it enough? So we always wanna be doing testing to determine what is present because if you're already almost there, we don't wanna be spending the money to think that you have to start from ground zero and build it all the way back. So a little bit of testing is required when we first start out. And that just takes a little bit of microscope um, analysis. And we have some remote sensing um, so that we can work with you on a microscope at your house. We'll do the determination, the quantitative part of it, and let you know what you're dealing with. So pretty inexpensive as, um, you know, it's gonna be about the same as what a soil chemistry test is going to cost. So we're going to then ask that you make compost or you buy compost, find compost that has the right sets of microorganisms in it. So if you wanted to do it yourself, we want to, there are several different ways of composting. So let me you know, just quick go over those. Um, there's thermal composting where you have to get the temperature high enough, long enough to kill all the pathogens in the pests. You know, the E. coli's gotta be gone, the salmonella, shigella, pasturella, all those things that, please don't stick your fingers into that <clears throat> organic mix at the very beginning and then lick your fingers because you will suffer. Um, so thermal composting, you have to get it hot enough, long enough. And the thing people often don't think about is, here's a compost pile. The middle of the pile is getting hot enough. You've got to get above 131 degrees Fahrenheit for a full um, three days, or above 55 degrees Celsius for a full three days. And you will kill all the most problem organisms. You cannot go anaerobic while that's happening because if you go anaerobic, you're not going to get to that temperature. You're not going to be killing the pathogens. So nice and hot in the middle, three days. But on the outside, is that up to the temperature? Well, uh, the outside atmosphere around your compost pile is not 131 degrees Fahrenheit or 55 degrees Celsius because you would be dead if you were trying to live in that kind of habitat. So you've got to get all of that outside layer moved into the middle. And that's usually going to take two turns in order to do that. So as you have that middle of the pile hot enough, long enough, now you're going to turn the pile so what was in the middle goes on to the bottom. What was on the bottom goes into the middle. And uh, so you've got to structure how you're turning your pile so that um, with the second turn, after the second turn, the third part of the pile that hasn't heated yet is in that hot pile, hot middle, and it's got to hit 131 degrees Fahrenheit, 55 degrees Celsius, for a full three days. Now, 
when you go to food microbiology, you realize that you don't have to, you're not stuck with 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days. If you can get it to 150 degrees so, um, Fahrenheit, which is something like 62 degrees Celsius, um, you only have to get it up to that temperature for 48 hours. If you can get it up to 160 or somewhere up around 70 degrees Celsius, you only have to get it up to that temperature for 24 hours. So you want to know how to get the biology in that compost pile to reproduce fast enough because that's what's causing temperature to occur is when that one bacterium divides in 20 minutes and becomes two and 20 minutes later now you've got four and 20 minutes later you've got 16 and 20 minutes later you've got uh, 1096 and 20 minutes later you've got 10 to the fifth bacteria and 20 minutes later you've got a billion billion bacteria every single one of those bacteria is releasing heat as it performs reproductive acts just like human beings just think of yourself the last time you did a little reproductive activity there was a little heat involved and so they're all letting off that heat and that's what causes the temperature to rise so you have to have organisms they have to be happy and producing heat it has to be aerobic for this to work so you're killing all the bad guys um, turn as soon as you've been up at high enough temperature long enough so you can see where we can compost in a very short period of time if we know what we're doing. Typically 21 days before that pile comes back down to ambient temperature and finished compost is by definition, it is when the temperature of that organic matter returns to ambient conditions. People who get sold compost that's still steaming, I'm sorry, that's not finished compost. You don't want to buy it because this guy is trying to convince you to do his work for him. Why are you paying that amount of money? But if you can get compost that has all the proper biology present in it at high enough levels that you can only have to buy one ton of compost to put out per acre, you are going to reap so many benefits from that that it's well worth it to spend $500 or $750 as, as we have people that we've trained selling their compost. If they're anywhere around LA, they're selling a ton of compost for about $3,000. So can you make some money at this? Yeah, but you better demonstrate that you've got the biology in that compost because if people know that you're making that really good quality, they're willing to pay the money for it. Now you get away from the big cities and the price tapers off a little bit. You can make the compost yourself. And of course, we have um, an online course where we teach people how to, to do this magic. Um, there's a lot of little, you know, don't look out for this and look out for that and look out for this other thing. And you've got to be recording things. And there's a bit of a learning curve. It's not outrageous. so. Um, we have online courses where we would like to have people take the introductory course first so you know why are you doing all this work to make really good biology and what are the balances that you have to get for different crops. So thermal compost. You can also um, do worm compost. And so in that instance, you've got to have enough worms in the top layers of your compost pile that any food resource that you put on the top of that worm bin is going to be completely comminuted, completely chewed on and broken down into little bite-sized um, worm bits that will then pass through their digestive system. And so as that worm chews on that material going through its digestive system, the worm takes a bite, and as it moves along its digestive system, then it crushes down that, the, um, you know, the waves of muscle that you can see pressing down. And what the worm is actually eating is the juice that pops out of each and every bacterium or fungus or protozoan or nematode or microarthropod that it crushed and caused it to burst open. So that material gets moved down the, the system because the worm keeps eating at this end. So it moves everything along. So now it 
compresses again and more juice is released. So move it along, more juice is released. And that's what the earthworm is eating. And of course, all these soluble nutrients are being released into that um, material in the digestive system of the worm. As that material moves into the rear end of the earthworm, this is just like a huge culture of the best organisms. As long as that worm is staying aerobic, it's going to be the best. There's your inoculum of really good guys. And so if you buy or you get earthworms from a really good forest or you get earthworms from a really good uh, worm bin, you've got your inoculum. Just start your worm bin and start feeding them. But you have to make certain that all of that material on the surface of that um, worm bin that you just added as the raw organic material. The worms have to come up and chew on that and make it disappear within three days. And typically that's because we've got to be in a warm enough place to keep the worms active and happy and doing their thing. And in that instance, if you've got any little fruit fly wandering nearby, you have any little white fly, any of these noxious insects, they are going to stop on that unchewed on organic material and they're going to lay a bunch of eggs, especially if it's any, even the closest bit towards anaerobic. Mama fruit fly is going, oh, this is the perfect place because I know all my little babies are going to have lots of bacteria to eat. And so lays those eggs. Three days later, they hatch, and now you've got a thousand fruit flies running around, all ha having sex, and then they're going to lay eggs on everything that didn't de get, get decomposed. And so you can't ever let this get out of hand unless you like breathing in fruit flies and white flies and you know all those nasty different kinds of flies that there are out there. So you just have to make sure you don't overfeed your worms. And the worms will chow on all that food, mix it, pull it into the soil, and because worms um, build worm passageways, it, uh, it keeps all of that material aerobic. So you don't have to turn that pile at all. All you have to do is every three days be putting out the food so that those worms have something to eat, but you've, they've got to process all of that. So now, again, we've got this um, food web of all these wonderful, beneficial bacteria and fungi and protozoan nematodes, microarthropods, maybe even some spiders running around in there. So really good material. Most people will put material on the top, and as the worms chew on it, you know, then the next layer comes in and the worms chew on it. So you slice the, the bottom inch or so off of the worm bed and you capture that material, you let it dry a little bit. Earthworms have to be kept at about 70% moisture in order to keep them happy. So you're going to have to let that dry out, but now you've got worm compost that's every bit as good as a thermal compost, whatever. The third kind of composting is static composting, and that's typically where you've got to make the structure of the pile in a particular fashion so that um, you are pulling oxygen in from the bottom and then the CO2 is coming out the top in kind of in a chimney effect. And so building that pile, you have to leave the outer layers aerobic at all times. The middle of a static pile will go anaerobic. And you're planning on that as long as you're keeping the outside layer aerobic so that all of those noxious gases moving up through all your nitrogen blowing off is ammonia, all your nitrogen blowing off is nitrous oxide, um, all of the sulfur going away, your phosphorus will be going away because all of those gases leave the pile. Yeah, but you got the aerobic layer, so those organisms will capture those gases and hold them in. The last thing you'll do on a static pile is to mix all of that together so that you mix all of the phosphorus, sulfur, all those nutrients that have gotten highly concentrated in the outside layers, they've got to get mixed back into the pile so that you've got good um, food resources. It's quantitatively more difficult to do a good um, static pile. So I, I try to 
say to people, you, you really have to come work with us to learn kind of the secrets of doing a really good um, static pile. So the thermal piles and the worm bins are fairly easy. You can figure it out pretty rapidly. Static piles take a couple years for people to really get it. So I'm not going to delve deeper into <laughs> those, that kind of compost. Yeah, that's great. But um, the, the purpose is always to build up those populations of microorganisms so that you're reaching the levels that the plants you want to grow require. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.